I'm not trying to make, get anybody to leave my class, you know, but we're starting the first principles class this morning. Uh, Dennis George is teaching it. It'll be in the back, one of the back rooms back there. Uh, first principles class, I think, think probably many of you would enjoy it. Um, I think we ought to let them teach it in here too uh, at some point because certainly we can all be refreshed on what what first principles are and what we're supposed to believe, the basics. And I'm through talking about that now, but I announced it. So you can, you can leave and I won't take offense, especially since I'm not looking up right now. You can slip right out. Uh, 2 Samuel, we're going to finish up very quickly today in this, and we're going to start uh, on the subject of Islam. And Islam and what we face with that, or what we should think about facing uh, Islam. Anyway, uh, what we see in first in Second Samuel is uh, David uh, has gone through a trying time with his son Absalom, trying to usurp the throne. He comes he comes back to power. He's getting some age on him, uh, and what you start seeing is is a wrap up, if you will, of his of his life in chapter twenty three, Second Samuel twenty three. Um. You have a list of David's mighty men. And so it's this old warrior himself reflecting back on his life, you know, and all of the great soldiers that he's fought with. And, and the only thing I'm going to say about that is that there's one person that he doesn't mention as being a great soldier that, that is troubling to me. His name appears in the list, but kind of as an associate, not as as a great warrior, and that's Joab. Now, I know I, <clears throat> and bouncing around and, and running through the book as quickly as I have, uh, you may not have got to know David's family as well um, as, as, as I do, it. and I'm not bragging, I just, I, I'm intrigued by Joab and Abishai, but they're his nephews. And Joab, just let's review this quickly. What all has Joab done for David in his lifetime? That, that's a question for you. What all has Joab done for David? Now that, I, I don't mean for silence to take place. Uh, go ahead and speak up. If somebody else speaks up at the same time, we'll work that out. He's, he's been a tremendous general. Exactly right. He he made good decisions for David. Uh, one in particular was uh, was uh, well. He, he probably shouldn't have. He probably should have captured Absalom, but he went to uh, David and rebuked David because David was grieving for Absalom and not not being grateful for the men that fought to preserve him uh, as king or or put him back as king. Uh, that's that's one thing. What else did he do? It, it's not a good thing, but he saves da He tries to save David by 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 working with him uh, to have to have the soldier killed by Sheba's husband. Remember, da Joab is the one that that pulls that off for David. And you say, well, that's that's not a good thing. No, but it's it's a loyal thing. And he's loyal to David. And David is constantly wanting to get rid of him as general. You know, here, the first one that gets in to the city of Jerusalem gets to be the new general. Well, you're not going to beat Joab out, so Joab wins that. But he's always trying to replace him. But anyway, in this list, he doesn't. He mentions Abishai, the brother of Joab. He, he, he mentions him, but he doesn't, he doesn't commend Joab for the years of service and and, and for the loyalty that he's shown, which, which bothers me. But we don't have the, the entire story. He also mentions verse in 24, Azahel, the other brother of Joab, which, uh, which got killed fairly early on in the story. Um, but anyway, a list of men. Now, chapter 24. 
uh, is is a is a strange story, um, and we could spend a lot of time on it, but I'm I'm not I'm just I'm choosing not to. I would also uh, tell you that you need to compare this to First Chronicles, the same account. It seems to, seems to differ. Um, critics would come to you and say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. This book says this, the other book says something else. I don't think there's a contradiction. I think there's, you need to blend the two stories. The same thing is true in the death of, uh, of uh, good grief. Of all things, can't think. <laughs> Judas Iscariot. And believe it or not, I just couldn't think of Judas's name. How did Judas die? He hung himself. Well, how does the book of Acts portray his death? If he falls and bursts asunder. And those things, you put them together. He hung, on, he hung there until the rope broke or the limb broke and he fell and... and and busted. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but uh, terrible, terrible story. And I think that's what you run into in Second Samuel twenty-four and First Chronicles, the account of this, in which David takes it upon himself to to take a census. And you say, well, what what's really wrong with that? Well, I don't know what's really wrong with that, other than it's apparent that God didn't want him to take a, to take a census. And Joab, again, wants to do the right thing and says, look, may you have a hundred times more soldiers than you think you do. We don't need to do a census. And so Joab, once again, comes, tries to get David to do the right thing. And anyway, they do a census, and the next thing you know, um, calamity hits. And, and, and we'll just look at quickly. Uh, chapter 24, verse 10, David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. In other words, he knew he'd done wrong. And David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done, but now, Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's ear, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine, I, I, I see there's a textual variance here, right? Huh? Seven years of famine. Um, now, why would there be a difference there? Let's talk just briefly on that. Why would there be a textual difference there? I'm waiting, waiting on y'all to talk again. That's, that's pretty good. I, pretty, you got a scribe that maybe on, on one of the many texts, a scribe's daydreaming, and you know, when he's supposed to be writing, and, and he writes seven, thinking back to Joseph's day. But the tr probably more than anything is that you, the, the, the writing of numbers in Hebrew is very difficult. And so it could be just, it could be almost an indistinguishable uh, mark that set those two words apart. You also have to remember um, that the King James Version, translated in 1611, about the oldest Hebrew manuscript that they had to work with was from around 1100 A.D. In other words, they didn't have real old Hebrew manuscripts, whereas modern translations now have Hebrew manuscripts going back uh, two centuries before Christ. So the King James, uh, the text that they may have had, or the text they had, the, the, and by the way, the very limited number of texts they had. I guess one of them had one of the, the, the what they considered a more trustworthy text had the number seven, whereas probably number three is, is, is the accurate thing. It doesn't make that much difference in the long run, but you do need to be aware that there are textual variances. Uh, anyway, so shall three years of famine come into your land, or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? 
or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Bathsheba, in other words, from one end of the country to the other, 70,000 men. That's a high price to pay, isn't it, for, for one man's mistake. And when the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who is working destruction among the people, it's enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel was striking the people. He says, Behold, I've sinned, I've done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And so this is, this is a, a tragic way to end a book. You know, you'd rather go out, and you do go out with David building an altar and worshiping God, but you'd rather this story kind of end on a far more positive note than David wanting to take this census, even though the Lord didn't want him to, even though Joab advised him not to, he takes it, and it ends up costing 70,000 lives. Now, why? I'm not sure, and, I, and I'm not even going to pretend to know. But read that, that and the corresponding uh, story in, in Chronicles, and, and take a look at the differences there, and try to, try to work those things out in your mind. In, in 1 Kings chapter 1, you've got David in his old age, um, He's got one son, Adonijah, that decides, hey, dad's, dad's no longer able to be king. I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be the king. <laughs> but that wasn't the plan. And uh, you've got some people working uh, for Adonijah. You've got some people working for Solomon, and, and God is on their side. So you've got Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba. By the way, Nathan is the prophet that went in and, and pointed out David's sin with Bathsheba, but he's now working on behalf of uh, Solomon and Bathsheba. They go in and they, they say, now, now, David, uh, we were pretty sure you wanted uh, Solomon to be king, but your son's out here, uh, Adonijah, out here announcing himself to be king. Well, Solomon ends up being anointed as king, and so what you've got is a little bit of chaos already, being a real possibility in Solomon's, uh, during Solomon's reign. And then you have this wonderful text uh, of chapter 2 of 1 Kings in which David is given Solomon advice you know, on what it means to be king. And uh, some of it, it like I say, it, it's just this great text that starts off and says, Be strong and show yourself a man, serve God. And, it, and then it, from that point on, it sounds more like pagan, pagan kings than it does godly kings because he starts saying, okay, kill this person, kill this person, and all of that. And so that ends the life of David. Terrible job of wrapping up, but I'm going to get started on this today, which is of some interest to maybe some of you. Islam. How many Muslims are there? I spoke on this during vacation Bible school. How many Muslims are there in America? A lot. <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> How many? Somewhere between 3 million and 6 million. Now, to put that in perspective, how many members of the Churches of Christ are there in the United States of America? A little over a million. So we have three times as many Muslims, maybe six times as many Muslims in America as we do members of the Church of Christ. Now, how did all that uh, take place? <laughs> you know, I think back on, on my life. Now, I realized that I didn't get out much, uh, didn't get off Weekly Creek Road very much growing up, and really saw no need to because we had paradise there in my mind. Uh, but when I was a kid, I remember going to Joe Wheeler Dam down in, uh, I guess that's Florence, 
I don't know, somewhere, wherever it is. It's outside of Florence, Alabama. Anyway, went, went there, and I remember seeing my first foreigners. They were Japanese. Uh, and, and, and some of you remember back when, years ago, there were Japanese uh, tourists everywhere. They always had a bunch of cameras. <laughs> and it was just so strange seeing those. Now, in, in from that point on, how much has our country changed? And I realize that, that our, uh, our country already had big cities with uh, all sorts of people from all sorts of uh, all parts of the world, but everybody around where I grew up looked like me, sounded like me. And then we, we start having this wave of Hispanics. Um, and, 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 and now it went from being a wave to a tsunami. Big, big difference, right? To how many Hispanics are there in America? I don't, I don't know. I don't think our government could tell you precisely how many Hispanics are in this country. But I think that we now have the, uh, we're the fifth largest nation in the world with Hispanic, uh, having the Hispanic speaking group of people. Because we, we, we've probably got, I, I, I'm going to say that the, I know this is pretty accurate. The African-American population makes up about 11%. I'm pretty sure the Hispanic population is up around 15 or 16%. All that's happened, what, in the last 25 years, you think? Something like that. And everybody gets all bent out of shape about illegal immigration, and I understand that that uh, I understand that's an issue. It doesn't seem to really have affected our economy uh, as much as some people said it would. Uh, but it is. I mean, it's what we're dealing with. We've got a population of, of millions and millions of Hispanics, and we haven't risen to the challenge. Uh, and I say we, and I'm putting myself in that. I haven't gone to the trouble of learning Spanish. Um, I haven't equipped myself to reach, reach this massive population of Hispanics in this country. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of them in Bowling Green to where we have a little Mexico on the, on the west side of Bowling Green. The churches haven't done nearly enough. Now, we do have a Hispanic ministry going on that we're helping support at the University Heights Church, and it's doing real well. And our own Cash uh, Wilson from here uh, is helping out in that, and that's exciting. But in that time of us worrying about all of these illegal immigrants, the the I I I'll be honest with you. I think the the most dangerous threat to America has been going on quietly and unprotested, really, in the legalized immigrants that have been brought into this country. Because while our focus and our politicians have focused on we're going to build this wall, we're going to keep the Hispanics from coming in, and while we've been fussing about that. We've imported millions of Muslims. And, and it seems to have taken place without us noticing. Now they estimate that there are three to six million Muslims in, in the United States of America. I don't know if that's including, I, I would assume that it's a, including all of the ones that Western Kentucky has brought here as students to make money for Western. I know that the same is true at Tennessee Tech in Cookville. We stopped there, Lee and I stopped there and ate a meal with uh, Mark and Tammy Loftus. And uh, we went to this restaurant. I don't remember which one it was. It doesn't matter. Went to a restaurant. I thought I was in Saudi Arabia. And the only people who looked like me were the wait waiters and waitresses. What's happened in our country? Is there a danger uh, that we brought all of these Muslims over here? Well, what, how are we supposed to react? How are we supposed to reach out to them? And, and can we reach any of them? Can we lead any of them to become Christians? Well, that's some of the things that I want to explore 
in this, and I want to kind of teach you a little bit about Islam. Uh, let's, let's start with the beginning of Islam, which, which is Muhammad the prophet. He was born in 570, and he grew up, uh, he lost his dad before he was born. His dad died in an accident before he was born. He lost his mother while he was still very young, and he was raised by his grandfather, who he also lost. And then he ends up being raised by an uncle. Now, he's born in uh, Mecca, which was in modern-day Saudi Arabia, but at that time wasn't really a nation. It was just a territory. Uh, at, at some point, he, he gets a job and he, uh, working for this very rich widow and a tra running a trade caravan. Now, this is important for you to, to, to understand uh, the teaching of Islam, I think. He's traveling around all the time on her behalf, <clears throat> and he's learning from all of these different people that he encounters. Now, when you're traveling around and you don't have TV, and you don't have cell phone, which obviously they didn't have, what do you do at night? You sit around the campfire and you tell stories, you talk, you teach. Well, there's no doubt that Muhammad was hearing from Jews and Christians in his travels. The problem is that some of the Jewish stories and some of the Christian stories were heresy, not mainstream Christianity. And you see that reflected in the Quran. You have Muhammad uh, quoting from some of the uh, heretical forms of Christianity. Now Muhammad ends up marrying this, this widow. And now he's a comfortable married man. And she's, let's see, she's I think 20, 20 years older than him. I forget exact span not that that matters but anyway he marries her she has two or three children one of she has a son but he dies but he, she has two or three daughters that that live now at the age of 40 he starts going to a cave and 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 he according to islam he starts receiving revelations from god delivered to him by the angel gabriel and so he starts sharing with some of his close associates what God is saying to him. Now, I'm, I don't believe that God spoke to him. I'm, I'm just saying it like, he would, like they would say it, okay? So he starts teaching some of his close associates what God is saying to him, and supposedly they memorize everything that he says. And so from... Uh, the age of 40 to the age of 60, he is supposed to have received these continued revelations. Now, Muhammad could not read or write. So he's depending on his friends to write down these, these revelations that he's having. Now, just as a show of hands, how many of you have ever read the Quran? Parts of it? Uh, when you read the Quran, what did you find? What, what was your experience with it? A lot of similarities. In, in what way? You do read a little bit about the creation. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Uh, here's, here's what, you, you all need to do this, and, and it's going to be difficult. You're not going to enjoy this experiment, and you're not going to enjoy it, but you ought to go online, read, read the Quran, read, read a surah, a chapter or two, and, and go back and work through it two or three times because it's going to take you that. It doesn't translate very well into English. It's difficult reading. And when it does translate, um, the way they spell Jesus is different. The way they spell, pronounce Mary is different. So you'll see Miriam. And so you may be reading about characters that you know about, but you may miss, 
you know, who it's talking about because of the name. But mostly it is about judgment. That's mostly what it's about. Constantly bombarding you with judgment. It does mention the creation story. It does mention uh, 25 prophets in it that we're familiar with. Uh, well, no, let me back up. It mentions 24 that we're familiar with from the Bible, and then it has another one that was supposedly a prophet in the Arabian Peninsula that nobody really knows anything about. Um, but you ought, to, you ought to try to read it, because here's what you need to do. If we're going to get in a conversation with Muslims, and that's something that most of us are going to encounter, I guarantee you uh, we've got some medical professionals here that will encounter will then be encountering them sometimes maybe on a daily basis. Uh, one of Amy's best friends at, at the medical center uh, is, is a Bosnian Muslim, and, and from what she has told me, uh, he is probably one of the most moral people at the hospital. I mean, just a good, good human being. In fact, he quit the department he was in because of, of the immorality <laughs> that is going on within that department. He just wasn't going to put up with, with some of the stuff that they were doing. Like, I'm not even going off in that. You can ask me later what that was about. But anyway, um, good moral person. She and him discussed uh, Scripture. Now, if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to be able to converse with them and I'm going to be able to say, would you please read your Bible and tell me what you think, they're going to, in turn, going to say, well, are you going to read the Quran?" And we ought, we ought to be... If we have truth, we have nothing to be afraid of. I, I believe that. We have nothing to be afraid of. Um, but just reading the Quran and reading the Scripture is probably not going to be enough. We're going to have to go a little bit deeper if we're going to ever reach them because uh, one of the things that is true of Islam is that you have very, very, very few people that leave Islam. What's the main reason for that? You'll be killed. That's exactly right. Now, Christianity has not always been uh, at its best, right? Christianity hadn't always been at its best. Uh, there have been times, and I'm speaking very broadly of Christianity. I'm using... Uh, the umbrella term for everybody that says they believe in Jesus at this at this moment. You know, there was a time where the Catholic Church uh, basically said to people, be baptized or die. And they had trials in which if they found any discrepancies in a person's belief, they put them to death. But as far as I know, we don't have people running around threatening Jeff, if Jeff leaves the, leaves the church to kill him, we don't do that, right? In Islam, if you, if you leave the Islamic faith, you are supposed to be put to death. So, it, obviously, that makes it hard for any, any of them to leave. It also is seen as a major betrayal to their family, which can also call for an honor killing. Um, but they are taught from day one that the Bible has been corrupted. Okay, so you're going to run into that. They're going, their response is going to be, when you say, would you read the Bible, the, only, the main thing they've got going through their head is from the moment they were big enough to hear, they have been hearing that the Christian Bible has been corrupted, that it can't be trusted. <laughs> the, the version of Christianity that Muhammad knew is the corrupt is a corrupted version of it. Also, what he knew about Judaism, a lot of it is corrupted Judaism. That's true. And where did he learn that? I want I want to keep coming back to that because that's important in our understanding of how the the Quran came into being and how some of the stories. Uh, became a part of Islam. So we're going to, we're going to, we need to go ahead and just bite the bullet and read a part of the Quran. And you're going to struggle with it. And you may have to read a commentary on it.
But here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn that it does tell a little bit about creation. It does tell a little bit about Noah. In fact, what I found, the, the longest narrative in it, and there's very little narrative in the Quran, is the story of Joseph of the Old Testament. And, I, and, and, I, and I'm running ahead of myself, but, you know, in, in looking at this for the past 15 years, trying to study the Quran a little bit at a time and studying Islam in general, I, I began to ask questions like, okay, it's, it says something about Noah and the flood, but it doesn't tell you. How in the world do they know these stories? If the Quran is sufficient, it is the sufficient guide for all of Islam where are the stories? Where is the doctrine? Because it's not there. So where do they get all of these background stories from if it's not in the Quran? And I finally found the answer. The answer is that they had to have additional material. Now, a Muslim would never admit that, but they are totally relying upon what are, what are called the Hadas, which are the sayings and examples of Muhammad the Prophet. One collection has 300,000 sayings and actions of the Prophet. It took them 300 years to put those together. So do you think they're pretty much all accurate? Uh, no. They wouldn't know much of anything except for God was going to judge the world if they have the Quran. That's pretty much all they're going to know. So you have all of these biblical stories, but you have them twisted in a different way in all of these hottest. And I've already, I told you one during vacation Bible school. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you other examples. But the one thing, here's an easy one. Uh, Adam and Eve, when they were created, I've mentioned this here before, when they were created, they were about 70 feet tall. And the paradise they were placed in was actually heaven. And so, when they got, now that doesn't sound like the biblical account, does it? It does mention in the, in the Quran that they were created uh, out of a drop of blood or out of a drop of semen or out of spot of mud. It, it's uh, three different possible translations for that one, one word in the Quran. That they were formed pretty much the way Adam and Eve in the Bible was, was uh, created. But in the Bible you have them on, on earth. And they're cast out of the garden because of sin in the Quran version, well, in the Islamic version, you have them created in, and placed in heaven, and when they sin, they get kicked out, and, and uh, Adam li uh, lands in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and Eve lands in India, and they wander around until they find each other, which if you're 70 feet tall, it's easy to find a person that way. And I bet if you're 70 foot tall, you're, you can holler louder than we can. And since that time, people have been getting increasingly smaller, according to the Quran. If I'm not mistaken, that's what's happening is the reverse of that, is it not? Because we're taller and bigger now than... Than, than 50 years ago, 100 years ago, yeah. But the, 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 the teaching is, is that we're getting constantly smaller. But when we get to heaven, Natalie, you little short Natalie back there, you get to be 70 feet tall. Isn't that great? You little shrimp, you're 70 feet tall. <laughs> That's something we got to look forward to. Now, according to Islam, 
So you run into you run into these stories that you have you have to go in search of, uh, and they and they basically are a rewrite of the biblical stories. Uh, where they can say, now, nah, now, nah, see, all of yours is corrupt. We, we've got the right version. Well, there's a problem with that. Christianity had been around for 600 years before Muhammad, who couldn't read or write, starts to preach. Then the stories about all these biblical characters come along another 100, 300 years. So we're talking about 800 years after Christianity, basically, Along comes these people that says, you got it all wrong, we've got all the answers. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, but that's pretty pretentious, isn't it? Pretty arrogant. And then go back and say, well, now, wait a minute, you Jewish people, you have really had it wrong. We're going to rewrite all those stories and tell you where you're wrong. Listen, forget the fact that our that our main prophet uh, couldn't read or write uh, and didn't write a single word down. We're just going to tell you everything you've got is wrong. Well, that's, that's the, what we're up against in trying to teach somebody that is a Muslim. Now, please keep in mind, I'm saying some mean-sounding things. I'm not saying anything that's not true. And I don't believe that it will help anybody if we're mean to a Muslim person. I think we ought to be kind and gracious to them and be composed. So when they make accusations that infuriates us, that we don't show them our ugly side, we, we stick by truth and we present it in love. That's, that's what I think is important. And we don't get rattled because... Just because we don't have an answer right at that moment don't mean that we, we can't come up with an answer. That is a legitimate, fair, sound answer. I think we've got to I think we've got to come to terms with converting pretty much anybody today, not just a Muslim. Converting anybody today uh, takes longer than what it used to. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, um, you bring up something very interesting. A lot of people, uh, let me, some, of, some, of, some of you may not know what the Council of Nicaea is. It's okay to study that. Uh, we, we ought to study it because we, we do. We, how did the New Testament come together? We, to be honest, if we're really going to discuss things on an intellectual level, we need to know some of this stuff. How did the New Testament come together? I'm not knocking the King James uh, when I say this, but this is basically the way I grew up believing. Basically, God dropped the King James Version, leather-bound, red-lettered edition out of heaven. That's the way we got the Bible. And that's not the way it happened. And it was a little disconcerting when I found out that they actually debated on which books belonged in the New Testament. But if you study that long enough, you come away with every bit as much confidence as you, as you start. Well, actually, you come out with more confidence than you started out with. There's, not, there, there's very little doubt that what we have is the Word of God. We, we do run into little things that bother us a little bit, like whether it was three years of famine or seven years of famine. I mean, we, we, but we, get, we can admit that and work through that. That's not, it doesn't become that big of an issue. I'll tell you a quick story, and then I think class about to be over. But you come to me, ask me questions that you want me to deal with. Uh, that's the best way for me to teach what you need to hear or want to hear, is that you let me know what you want me to address, and, and I certainly will try to address it. Um, I took a class entitled, How to Study the Bible. 
And I was so mad that I was having to pay whatever it was per hour for this class because I, when I was going to undergraduate Bible school, folks, I was so poor. I didn't have, I had a vehicle that uh, it, it, I, I, I would park it where church people wouldn't see it. I, they didn't. They would have been ashamed of it, but they should have been ashamed. They were paying me so little, too. But anyway, at that time, but I drove an old beat-up pickup truck, and I didn't have insurance on it, okay, for two years because I couldn't afford it. I know it's illegal, but it was in Alabama, so it didn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> I was so mad I had to take his class. Because I thought, this doesn't even make sense. Well, our teacher started introducing us, Matt, to all this stuff that probably your brother has read where you question the, the, the text and whether you, can it, is it reliable? And we ended up, it ended up being probably the hardest class that I had on, on the undergraduate level. And, and some of you heard me tell a story. You know, semester 16 weeks long, about... By the 14th week, I was ready to throw my Bible away. Because all I'd been reading was the critiques, the higher critics of the Bible. I was ready to throw it away. Why am I even doing stand-up talking about this? Everything in it's questionable. And our teacher stood up one day and he said, so what do you think about all this? And this guy sitting behind me, he had more courage than I did. He said, you really want to know what I think about it? He said, Yeah. He said, I think this is the most painful bunch of junk that I've ever read in my life. And our teacher said, me too. <laughs> he said, but every one of you, if you go into graduate school, you're going to get hit with this every semester. And he was right. And he said, now what you need to understand is, is most of this stuff is their opinion and they're human beings, and they're magnifying issues that are not big, that big issues. And so for the next two weeks, he put us back on solid ground. I think we can do that. We need to do that periodically here. We need to study why the Bible is reliable. Uh, because that does come into play. Uh, when, when we're going we're gonna to talk about Muslims, because all they hear is the Bible has been corrupted. The Bible has been corrupted. Well, if we show them that we don't mind studying their book, if they'll study our book, then we've got a good start, hadn't we? Because what converts people? You or the Word or the Spirit working through the Word? It's not you. It's the Spirit working through the Word. It converts people. So we're off to a good start. All right, the bell is rung. Hope to see you all this evening. I don't know what...